Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This month, John Ladley and Kelly O'Neill will be discussing the difference between business sponsored and business led. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO Vision. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right corner of your screen to access that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. Joining John in the series this year is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners. Having worked with the software and systems provider key to the foundation of master data management, Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of MDM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice in the intricacies of implementing MDM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007 and has been a great partner with Dataversity ever since, um, recently writing a, our latest research paper, BI versus Data Science. And with that, I will turn it over to John to, to get today's presentation started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending uh, our um, discussion here. And um, uh, first of all, just a quick sound check. I'm being heard, Shannon. You did it right after I muted myself. Yes, you sound great. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to welcome to the CDO Vision webinar series. My uh, good friend and now colleague, uh, Kelly O'Neill. Uh, Kelly, uh, welcome aboard. Thanks. You know, I'm really happy to be joining uh, this prestigious series, so I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you for the invite. And uh, awesome, and uh, now we're prestigious. That's, that's terrific. Okay, so let's move on into our uh, 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 topic here. You know, the difference between business-led and business uh, sponsored. First, uh, a quick look at some upcoming events. Um, we have a CDO uh, next month, uh, Jeff Gentry, and we're going to talk about frameworks and frameworks like Zachman frameworks and planning frameworks and really cool artifacts like that. March 3rd, uh, Kelly and I uh, will be back uh, uh, um, on the role of data models and other uh, key artifacts. Uh, so just keep those on your calendar, uh, block those off, those are going to be rich. The rest of this year will be an incredible series of events of very rich content around data strategy, chief data officers, uh, the CXO, and what uh, is happening in this realm of information management and data governance. Uh, so uh, keep this time blocked off, uh, We and we appreciate you doing so. So let's talk about uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, data governance can be defined as a business program. We have all heard many times on these uh, sessions that they are uh, business programs. Um, but we need to distinguish the difference between business-sponsored and business-led because uh, often we get into the situation of a business sponsor versus an IT-led event, which sets up an entirely different dynamic than when the program pivots itself to being actually a really a, a, a genuine business-led or business program. Sponsored doesn't necessarily make it business-led. It just means it's sponsored. Go over a few uh, scenarios uh, there and then um, uh, uh, talk into how to pivot it and, and how to create some of those more actionable differences from business-led to um, to uh, uh, the, the business program. Uh, Kelly um, has uh, been working on a lot of, of these types of efforts as I have. Uh, I think, Kelly, you can confirm that there is uh, a, a distinct difference between uh, the two. 
Yeah, you know, as you were talking about this, it just made it very clear. Sponsorship in many organizations is kind of a nebulous term. It's not really clear what the role is of a sponsor. What do they do? Are they involved every day? Is it once a month? Is it once a quarter? And I think that that's one of the challenges, whereas if there is a true leadership role and leadership of a program means accountability for success. And that's a much clearer definition. So I think that that's one of the, the indicators. But, but yes, I think it's important to recognize the difference. Ab absolutely. We could probably do a whole series of events on just how to be a better sponsor uh, for many uh, uh, of, of um, uh, the, the business leaders out there that find themselves leading a, a data-intensive uh, program. Um, uh, uh, later in the year, we're going to be coming back around to this topic. <clears throat> For now, though, let's talk about a bit of a, a scenario in the show. The show really where uh, these, uh, these differences are. As Kelly has said, uh, uh, the sponsor, the sponsor can be kind of nebulous because uh, sponsor, sponsor. Hello, hello. Sorry to interrupt, but you're really breaking up. Oh, okay. Can I now we've had some problems with clipping, clipping the internet, the internet here. here. Uh, uh, let's, let's do let's do this. this. Uh, uh, I'm gonna we'll go to the next slide. I'll call back, back in, in on another in line. line. Uh, can, um, I'm sorry, Kelly. Can, can, can you right. over and Kelly, go ahead. Hang up and yeah, not and, a problem. <laughs> sure, poor John. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that there's a couple of, of components here that, that are important to recognize. When we look at the most senior level roles in the organization, so the CXO, call it the CEO, the CFO, many times these people in the organization, they assume that governance and controls is, are already happening. And a lot of times when they're presented with this concept of, hey, we need your sponsorship or your buy-in to promote data governance, uh, it's shocking because they, they just assume, well, we've been under Sarbanes-Oxley for however many years now. Isn't, aren't these controls in place? We um, verify our financial reports. We verify external um, public announcements. So, you know, assuming these are all in place. And I think that that's really um, a difference between the people that are more on the management and execution side, they don't see that as already being in place. So uh, both might be true in the sense that there may be some high-level governance and controls, but there's not tactical governance and controls that would enable the folks on the ground, if you will, to be confident in the data that they are uh, consuming and using for their more managerial or operational reports. So, John, I don't know if you've uh, successfully dialed back in. I've heard a couple of dings. So just interrupt me when you are. Are you there? So let's just go back one slide then, John. I didn't necessarily finish slide four. But um, at the same time, there are uh, – business-driven programs that might be cross-functional, such as Lean and Six Sigma, so that there's really focusing on operational excellence. There might be uh, regionally specific programs that focus on, say, privacy within uh, certain uh, jurisdictions and geographies. There might even be line of business initiatives that are pushing the organization forward. Um, and then IT, you know, part of the reason that this graphic was created is that IT tends to be capturing all of that at a very tactical level and seeing the conflicts, the issues, the uh, discrepancy, and the uh, lack of productivity as a result of uh, not having the information and the data in a place that can support these already existing business programs and expectations. And with that, I might turn it over to John. I think it's, it's you're back on, and I don't know if you want to pick up on slide five. Okay, then I'll go ahead and keep going. <laughs> uh, no, uh, here I am. John is back. John is back. John, Hi, John. John was muted. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I, was, I was talking and I was muted. Um, uh, Kelly's got this one, you know, wrapped up. I'm going to move ahead. Just wanted to add one more thing that, uh, you know, the key here is that IT might be able to do this. An awful lot of these uh, efforts are IT-led, and that's fine. But, but look at history. 
the, the CXO uh, or the CEO or anyone, they live in a world of governance, they live in a world of controls. Uh, business areas live in a world of putting in sea change programs, transformational programs. Um, they're, in essence, used to doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, and, and a lot of other folks in the technical uh, pursuits, like, like uh, where most of us that are present on the call, uh, either listening or giving, have come from, um, we're not used to that. So, so there, there is, there's an advantage uh, uh, to this. Um, so at that point, I think I'll move in. Uh, Kelly, unless there's something else, you think uh, we're ready to go ahead and we'll get back on track here? Let's move on. All righty. So then... Um, uh, uh, it's real important for the the the, the business. Uh, we'll just use the CEO for example uh, uh, to, to be engaged with this. Um, uh, it, you know, if if you have, uh, you will get visible support all the way to the top if you're supporting the strategy. If you're not costing more than it seems you're going to bring in. If you're not adding to risk. Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, but if you're working for uh, maybe another scenario is, is a competitor in your industry uh, and, and their, their data governance uh, program or, or data program of some sort is not going well, very often you'll see that it's uh, IT driven and becomes a project and it, 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 or it's perceived as holding back other initiatives um, um, or, or because it's IT, uh, uh, middle management areas can, can uh, put up a form of resistance or something like that. So, so, so your view of this and the engagement of the sponsor, the, 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 the uh, alignment with um, uh, this as a business initiative, whatever that effort is, is really, really key uh, uh, to success. Uh, so again, uh, sponsor, if they're really powerful, if they're really, really good, awesome. I mean, you're, you know, you know, go move, move forward. But often in many organizations, uh, you have to move from the sponsored model to the to the led model uh, to to be effective. You know, the end goal at all of this, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, is to get from this initial uh, contact awareness that. that a lot of organizations have, which is, gee, uh, we have to get, do something about this. Uh, none of our customer records match, or we send out the wrong invoices, or, you know, any number of common uh, drivers to this, uh, and move people up a curve. Now, either the sponsor has to be really powerful uh, and do all this, uh, or um, uh, or you need to uh, get that into the uh, context of a transformational uh, program. Uh, this is a series of events that uh, we use a lot in in our practice. Um, Kelly, there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of details in here, uh, aren't there, to get this thing from that awareness to that uh, ultimate uh, goal of internalization. Absolutely, and it needs to be a, a program and an effort that people are consciously making. It doesn't happen on its own. Absolutely. Um, you know, and internalization um, is, is, is that ultimate behavior that, that I talk about in a lot of my writing, and that is you shouldn't even really know that this program has occurred. A good transformational effort means that everyone just behaves the new way over a period of time. So if it's data governance, governance isn't a big special thing. Or if it's master data management, people take better care of their customer records or their product records or, uh, or, 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 or whatever uh, uh, like that. But it takes diligent effort to move it up this curve. If it's business-sponsored and uh, IT-led, there's a lot of back and forth. If it is business-led, it's more of a transformational program, which, as we've already said, is something that has happened in many organizations. So let's talk about data. We'll pick out data governance here as a business program and, and just talk about moving it and, and, and moving it around to um, uh, uh, the, the, the business-led uh, aspect. Uh, what we've noticed in our practice are four uh, significant uh, success factors. Um, and either the sponsor makes sure these are happened, the sponsor is powerful enough to uh, get these done or have the influence to get these done, or there is a transformational program in place that is business-led, and this becomes one of the features. Uh, we're going to go through a series of steps here to 
to uh, to, to uh, talk about how to uh, uh, make sure these success factors happen. But it's real important to keep these in mind. A lot of these aren't the typical success factors you might see. Business Align is something I've talked about an awful lot, um, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, but you also have uh, leadership and will. Um, uh, I think Kelly can chime in. A lot of times we'll do the talk at a conference, and we'll have someone come up and ask us a question about how to get a program unstuck. And it'll become very obvious in the conversation that the organization they are with hasn't quite committed to really doing this. They're still circling it. Um, um, I, I tell you an example in, in, in that I have recently was at, at the end of the talk, someone came up and said, um, uh, you know, we, we had a big team to start this, but now because of budgets, we cut it back to only three people. What can we do to keep it going? Well, my first thought was um, the organization doesn't have the will or, and or the leadership doesn't have the, the, the strength. I, I mean, do you, do you have a similar uh, example to bring to bear here? I'm, Sure, you do. Yeah. We've been doing this a bit. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And we recognize that there's budget cuts and there's budget constraints and things like that. Uh, however, uh, many times governance and other sorts of information management pro programs get cut more than other programs because these four factors aren't in place. And the uh, it's. Uh, you have to have the expectation that you need to respond to business changes. And if your business environment is becoming less strong, then there needs to be a way to support it. One of the things that is important to recognize also, though, is in a weak business environment, these sorts of activities help to improve productivity, shore up an infrastructure and a foundation that can respond more effectively to those changes in uh, economics. So that might be something um, to consider if you experience that. Yes, you 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 bet. Um, organization behavior, uh, something else that, uh, uh, in fact, we've instantiated at First San Francisco, a practice leader in the area of organization uh, behavior and a whole uh, subgroup of, uh, of consultants in that area. Um, and then lastly is just the ability of organizations to execute. There are organizations that just do things better uh, or parts of organizations that just do things better than other parts. And there's lots of reasons. Um, we're not uh, casting aspersions on, on any individuals here, but there's just sometimes it's structurally easier to get things done. And uh, it's uh, very often if, the, if there's a powerful business leader in the sponsor position or it's business led uh, and someone has rolled out a program before, it's a lot easier to attach to that individual or that style of, of, of execution. Um, uh, all the other things that you hear about success factors, uh, uh, of course, are still important. But when it comes to uh, that business engagement, and grabbing the program and moving it forward, these are the four that we really uh, look for and actually try to move organizations through. Uh, there are uh, three stages uh, to this type of um, work, and um, uh, we're going to just kind of step through those. One is the alignment, uh, which we've talked about, and I'm going to show some uh, uh, examples that uh, have we have looked at before on these. Uh, conferences, so I won't dwell a long time on those. Uh, next is the vision. What does this look like uh, uh, a day in the life? Uh, that is probably one of the most critical questions you will get asked uh, in, in this type of scenario by um, participating uh, peers or participating executives or leadership. And then lastly, pivot and operate the program. You either pivot from IT-led to business-led or you pivot it at a certain point from IT-run to business run and business absorb. But either way, there is a pivot action that has to occur. This is not, and this is probably, if you're going to take anything out of this talk at all today, take this one point. This is not a project type handoff, all right? There has to be some choreography and some planning to pivoting this thing from its being developed to being an operational mode. Uh, very often, um, uh, I have to explain 
to folks that even the team that you build the program with, if whether it's data governance or MDM, the group that assembles it, installs it, builds the requirements, does all of the work, gets the infrastructure set up, the policies, the procedures, the stewards, all of that. Those are many times not the right people to actually operate it. And, and so there has to be some activity there. And we're gonna just talk about those uh, stages here. First, the alignment stage. Um, uh, we've all seen this one before with a lot of the talks uh, I've done and it's a theme that you'll hear with First San Francisco uh, going forward. Uh, a lot of organizations respond to business saying, I want this, I want that, I want that. Um, that's the wrong approach to setting up these programs. These are programs that at an enterprise level, you have to look at enterprise needs. And we have an example there where some user is saying, I want access to all the detailed transactions, or I want to have analytics, or I want big data, I heard that's cool. Wrong approach. Right approach is uh, we have business needs, uh, capturing brand awareness, getting the attention of the millennials. What do we do with our information about that? Very important distinction. Again, sometimes a business sponsor has to be very powerful with this and hold back uh, meeting specific requirements, even not grease the squeaky wheel that might happen. And if it's business-led, it has to be very, very focused and very uh, supportive at the high level with some business alignment. Um, we have a model here of six things that you can do with data. We, we recommend strongly that you, you consciously walk through your organization's business strategies, and I mean business strategies. Installing big data or analytics is not a business strategy. That is a technology strategy in reaction to the business. So what we're talking about is, you know, go after the millennials or, or be, be compliant with the regulatory uh, challenge or something like that. And then deliberately look at how you're going to use the data to meet these. Are you going to improve processes? Are you going to try to be more competitive? Are you going to uh, create a product or monetize your data? Uh, are you going to uh, build some intellectual property that you can license or sell? Are you going to just enable your human capital at the point of contact with a customer or a product by better in other words, is there an operational aspect to what you want to do? And are you, or are you going to manage risk, which is something that we hear about a lot these days? You'll generate metadata requirements. You'll generate governance requirements. I could put four or five more columns after that. You're going to have maybe master data requirements, domain requirements, data quality requirements. But you can do a deliberate alignment at this point with, with things. And we've seen some great uh, success. Uh, I'm going to take a breath and a sip of water, um, and I'll let Kelly kind of wrap up on, on this slide as to some of the cool things that have happened around this, this model here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that uh, the devil's in the details in the sense that you can have these great statements around improving process and increasing value through certain categories, but how does your governance approach do that? How do your other capabilities around data management, like metadata, do that? And that's really the, uh, the level that you need to get down into is having the explicit statements of the activities and deliverables within your governance program and how they enable and increase value. So that's the, uh, one of the messages around this. In the next couple of slides, you'll see some examples of how uh, John and the rest of the team have done that very, very specifically. And I think that that's, that's uh, a big point here. Thank you. And um, so we have two quick examples, not going to spend a lot of uh, time on them. Uh, at the, they're in the nice yellow box at the top, just some type of good business strategy. And you can see how um, a deliberate effort has been made to decompose some of the objectives that come from that strategy into some data management requirements. And these could be, uh, you know, these data candidates of client household demographics. This could be uh, there are enterprise information management or EIM elements that will support that governance, MDM, analytics, all kinds of things like, like that. And we have there a nice little uh, decomposition of where we want to go, what we're going to do with the data, and what is the data that we're going to do something 
with. And, and again, as Kelly said, the devil is in the details as to what are the elements of EIM that go underneath beneath those. And, and this is an example of that. And it's another example to show you that this was a one-off. Here's a healthcare example, industry specific. Um, these are, of course, just one little tiny examples of very, very large spreadsheets and things like that. But again, we drive down from the strategy uh, into what we're going to do with uh, with uh, the data. So that's the alignment part. And, and, and in organizations where we've done this, we've actually had uh, some big smiles uh, in, in, in the room when, when they start to see that, that we're really just not selling another tech thing. Uh, there's actually some really good uh, things here. And, and, I, and as, as I transition to the next session, uh, maybe Kelly can uh, chime in here. When we have done this and business gets it, it's not very hard to have business support, is it? I don't, there's not a lot of resistance at this point. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that it is making that obvious link on behalf of a business person and creating that aha moment around how the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, customer experience, for example, is enabled by better governance and quality at client level, at client data levels. So creating that explicit link, which is what we're going to talk about in this next section. So uh, what we're going to do in this next section is to really make it practical and go through a step-by-step -step way of creating those tables, those diagrams, and the messaging around business-led governance. So, John, next slide, please. One of the key goals in our practice is really to provide practical information. And so hopefully you'll see that, um, and you have seen that from John in previous presentations. But we want you all to walk away from here with some activities that you can implement in your own program going forward uh, pretty much immediately. So John talked about the critical success factor of ensuring business alignment. But it, there needs to be some true material that is created that can be used to socialize, validate, communicate that information. And this is a, a presentation of alignment. Maybe it's creating the similar sorts of alignment spreadsheets. Maybe it's doing a, uh, a day in the life of what life used to be like pre-governed uh, data and what life is like post-governed data. But the idea is that within this alignment your material, you're creating a vision of the program and a purpose for why the program is being uh, implemented, being resourced in general. Part of that is, of course, linking that vision and purpose to very specific business needs and the data governance and data management activity to those specific needs. So creating that line of sight is a term that you've probably heard John use uh, quite a bit in the, fa in the past. And this line of sight helps to support the other success factor, which is creating uh, and identifying leadership and creating a will in the organization because they understand how governance supports those projects and initiatives that need to get done in order to progress the business. So once you've got some of that alignment material, you've got some understanding of the linkage to the business goals, objectives, projects, initiatives, et cetera, then you can start getting the organization behind you in the form of operational groups and identification of who needs to participate, when, how, et cetera. And so this is part of getting, of taking that picture and that plan and engaging the organization to participate. This engagement will be in the form of orientation. Maybe it's in the form of a series of meetings to uh, identify councils, to engage business sponsors. Uh, maybe it is with other leadership bodies to get their support and their backing. And it's down to the level of the accountable participants to execute as well. So, as you go through this process, this is, these are steps to get it started, if you will, and we will, in the next section, talk about sustainability. 
But you'll see here where you're taking this concept of business alignment and driving it through the leadership, engaging the will of the organization, and starting to move into that execution via the support of the leaders within the organization, et cetera. So next slide, please. Sometimes we do this via a pivot workshop. And so there's multiple ways of doing this, but one way is to do it via a pivot workshop. And this is a way where you can pull together these cross-functional uh, leaders within your organization. Uh, sometimes these workshops also include uh, senior members of the execution team, not just the leadership in the organization. Sometimes, however, it is nice to have these sorts of pivot workshops with just the leaders and then with the senior members of the execution team. Reason being is if one of the outcomes of these pivot workshops are to get the commitment of the leadership, get them to identify, retain, and activate a sponsor, that senior leadership group might be more comfortable doing it within this management team that they're used to working in versus a more hierarchically mixed uh, workshop organization. And then that senior leadership workshop can inform the workshop that's done with the members of the execution team. But I think what's important here is that it is a facilitated discussion. You can use some internal facilitators. We've uh, acted as external facilitators for our clients quite frequently, but you're really getting commitment as part of the outcome. So John, I don't know if you want to comment on this a little bit in terms of some success factors of these workshops and how to uh, go through that process of creating the vision and driving it down to the level of commitment. Thoughts? Well, I, um, I, I, um... I have opinions, but, but let's do thoughts. No. Um, the, uh, uh, well, a peek in here is this is a really powerful tool, um, that, uh, th this workshop. And, and uh, going through the efforts to get uh, people in one room talking about a topic that they have not prior perhaps discussed is, is extremely powerful. Um, uh, uh, but this is also a well-crafted, uh, so that my only final thought on this, this is a well-crafted, highly planned uh, type of meeting or series of, of meetings with some very specific outcomes. You want to come out of there with either really strong sponsors uh, um, uh, on the business side with business people lined up underneath them. Uh, um, you may see a handoff of a sponsor actually in the meetings. And then some clear steps, a white, you know, go up to the whiteboard and, you know, first we're going to do this to get it out of the program development to program operations, or we're going to get it unstuck from program development to business development, whatever it is. Uh, this is a highly crafted uh, uh, presentation, but the payoff on the time invested in this is enormous. Back to you, Kelly. Great, thanks. And I think the, the uh, one thing I want to highlight in what you just said is that this is many times a pivot point and an adjustment of a previously IT-sponsored initiative to a business-sponsored initiative, and that there should be a, an acceptance and feeling that that is all okay and that it is for the purpose of progressing the business forward and um, uh, progressing the, the program forward in a positive way, not in the uh, perspective of, of losing control from an IT perspective. So once we've gone through these workshops, then the next thing is to make sure that there's follow through. So I know that that's a, you know, kind of a, a moot point, but the reality is a lot of times we'll see a tremendous amount of excitement around these workshops. Everybody's really involved. Um, decisions are made. Uh, sponsors are identified. People accept the responsibility of the sponsorship verbally, say, yes, I'll do it. Great. Next steps. Well, if there's not follow-up after the workshop, decisions can be made and there's no reinforcement of those decisions and a lot of times those decisions need to be revisited or that the accountability that has been identified in those workshops uh, and the acceptance of that accountability and responsibility uh, becomes less meaningful 
if there isn't specific follow-up after the workshop. So just very uh, simply, there needs to be a summarization of the results and the activities and the follow-up to get people to then re uh, re-attest to accountability for those follow-up activities. Um, and again, this is the continued progression into operationalizing it and ensuring that people continue to maintain accountability for the activities and the projects. Um, part of ensuring that accountability is maintained is creating a measurement dashboard. So these sorts of dashboards can track both the progress of the program as well as the impact that the program can be, um, is being made to the business goals and expectations that have been identified in the business alignment materials that we've talked about previously. So that dashboard is a great tool to help maintain uh, momentum and accountability. Now, another great tool is, of course, that roadmap. And the roadmap is a critical guideline that galvanizes the resources to ensure there is forward progress towards those goals and priorities uh, that have been identified. Um, that roadmap then, of course, informs the implementation plan and uh, thus you can see a level of consistent operationalization activities as you go through this process. So I think a key point is to prioritize these follow-up activities so that you can take that momentum from the workshop and put that into an execution program. And of course, it needs to be revisited. So just putting all of this stuff together doesn't really necessarily mean that it's uh, successfully done unless there is some revisitation on a periodic basis and an updating of that measurement dashboard to ensure that there is progress. And I think that the uh, revisiting it every three months is a kind of a minimum in the sense that a quarterly update is really a minimum in our view. Excuse me, just sneezed. Um, so uh, you might want to consider revisiting it uh, sooner than quarterly, but at a minimum, a quarterly uh, review is important to ensure that you're continuing to make progress and have an impact. So next slide. Okay, so now we're going to talk specifically about uh, once we've created these foundational components, then what? So are we done? If we've gone through, we've done this workshop, and we've created the, the dashboards, the roadmap, the implementation, are we really done? Well, the idea is that you need to be thinking about this as a long-term program and discipline within the company, uh, just like you have expense management as an ongoing discipline. You have personnel management as an ongoing discipline. Data management and data governance is the same thing. It's an ongoing discipline, and you need to ensure that you have the people prepared to participate in the program going forward. So this is all about the sustainability of the program uh, once you have pivoted to a business-driven program. Uh, training takes the form of uh, awareness uh, and orientation, not just tactical, um, procedural, and process-oriented training. Uh, engaging uh, participants via the operating framework to ensure that there's clear accountability for those different roles, and then staffing is applying people and names to those operating frameworks and the operating model uh, so that you have the appropriate people to actually fill those roles. This is important in the sense that staffing uh, is one of those points where organizational change starts to occur and that people see that their roles are shifting they need to uh, release some of their previous responsibilities and take on some of these new uh, responsibilities. So it's important to uh, proactively identify that uh, adjustment when you are actually staffing to fill those roles. And then as you continue to operate and move into this sort of sustaining um, mode of your implementation plan, going back and ensuring that the staffing is continually appropriate to make sure that there's not a reversion back into old operational processes, the old way of doing things, and that people really do continue to uh, stay the course as it's been planned out um, to ensure that the governance program is becoming 
an operational discipline and is providing the impact that was originally planned uh, back when you're creating your business alignment materials. So uh, over to you, John. Thoughts, comments, and wrap up? Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, let's just move on into um, uh, just kind of a, a wrap up, and we have some uh, questions um, uh, going on here. Uh, just one more thought, actually, on um, this last slide on the steps to pivot, and that is the the uh, the operational um, slash sustaining uh, aspect. Um, uh, we have at the end of there the sustaining, which is the kind of the change uh, activities. Um, those really need to happen. All of this section here is kind of sort of doing the organization change management. But the, 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 the real, the real uh, areas to uh, reemphasize uh, that Kelly talked about are um, if, you, if your program is stuck, a lot of you have programs that are stuck, whether it's MDM uh, or data governance or analytics or whatever. If you're stuck, this is a great opportunity to adjust the operating model to get it unstuck. Maybe you you uh, haven't trained the stewards well enough, or maybe you haven't oriented business people enough to what data management is really about, um, and that it is a real critical business thing. This is another chance to um, allocate some time to those uh, steps. Uh, if you need to retrain some stewards or also train this pivot point is a perfect opportunity to do that. No one's going to holler at you because you're doing this again. You've got a, a, a bit of a shift here. So it is a, you know, um, you know let's, let's talk politics for a second. There's a movement here. Uh, there's a change in course uh, when something like this is happening. Um, so it's a perfect opportunity to reload uh, yourself on, on that. So, so move it into a wrap up and then some time for uh, questions and answers. And if you have questions, please, please, please submit them. Uh, um, we, will, we are happy to answer them. We are allowing a lot of time for questions here on uh, this session. I'm, I, our material is good. I'm sure it's wonderful, but I'm sure we're not answering every single question you have. So please feel free to, uh, to ask uh, some questions. Um, so something we hear, uh, whether, the, whether it's business-sponsored, IT-led, business-sponsored, business-led, where is uh, data governance? Where is data management? Where does all of this stuff live? Uh, the organizational aspects of this are very important. Later in the year, we're going to have, we're going to address this topic absolutely uh, specifically. Just remember that we're really not building out, when you're doing EIM, when you're doing uh, data governance, you're, you're not building out uh, additional technology capability as an end deliverable. You're, you're, you're using technology possibly to help you do something, but what you're really doing is getting a handle on your information asset. It can live in compliance and all that, but at the end of the day, you know, where does it live that, you know, we're going to go a little bit uh, honoring, you know, a little bit of the new Star Wars craze here. Um, uh, it, it's everywhere, all right? You are changing organizational uh, behaviors. You are building something into your organization that has not been there before. The more and more we get into this, the deeper we get. We're finding companies ask us, we're really doing something transformational here. We're, and they might say, we're not ready for that. They might say, let's take smaller steps there. Um, but uh, uh, even if you take smaller steps, what you find out is, is inevitably someone says, well, wait, you're doing some type of governance or MDM or analytics in this part of the organization. How does that plug into the rest of the organization? Whether you want it to be transformational or not, or whether you even brand it as transformational, um, a lot of this is, is in, in the way you manage it, in the way you lead it, in the way you build it, the transformational mindset is really powerful, uh, and it goes a long, long way. And that's why so much emphasis on this talk about the business sponsor, and whether it's business-led or IT-led, and either have a super, super strong sponsor if it's IT-led, or pivot that when you have the opportunity and go into operational mode, or even uh, if you're stuck and get it unstuck from IT and into business, get, get it into some type of, of growth mode. Um, and a lot of the techniques you saw uh, today were based on that.
So at that point, I'm going to just move us. Uh, there's our nice little uh, wrap-up slide. Remember, February 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, uh, uh, we are going to be talking with Jeff Gentry and a uh, really cool talk about frameworks and, and, and uh, diagrams and, and ways to show this to people that their eyes go wide open and they really, really, really love it. So at that point, we're going to take some questions. I'm looking at the questions uh, here. Um, uh, first uh, question, uh, let's see here. Uh, John, can you hang up the phone and dial back in? Okay, I think we covered that one. The next question. Uh, business sponsorship in some organizations seems to fill only one purpose, and that's to earn accolades for the sponsors themselves when the project succeeds or deflect plausible responsibility for failure. Um, has anyone uh, ever run into that? Kelly, uh, tell us uh, a, a sponsorship deficiency story, if you, if you uh, <laughs> uh, may. You know, uh, is <laughs> I think that the, the sad reality about human nature is we are all fundamentally all out for ourselves, right? And so um, having a sponsor who is fundamentally about promoting their own career isn't always a bad thing. I think the, the, what we want to figure out is how do we tie what we're trying to accomplish from a data perspective into their ability to promote their own career and leverage some of their um, uh, ambition to progress your program. And so when we're thinking about some of the steps that we just walked through here, it's really aligning to those personal goals. And that alignment exercise might be specific to that individual's personal goals. And, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing better than being part of getting someone a promotion because you have supported them in such a way that they were able to get that promotion that they were looking for uh, and move up in the organization. So I would kind of see that as a positive thing as long as you can leverage it uh, in, in a way that progresses your program. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, we've, a lot of questions have started to flow in heavily here, so, uh, so we can both be on our toes to answer that. I'm going to uh, toss the uh, question uh, asking over to Shannon, and that will free us both up for our brains uh, for uh, asking the question. So, Shannon, go ahead, and uh, you can fire off the next one, and we'll take turns answering. Sure, sounds good. Um, and, of course, one of the most popular questions that we get is people asking for a copy of the slides and the presentation. Just a reminder to everybody, we will be sending a follow-up email within two business days with links to both the slides and the recording for you. Um, so a question coming in, a business case showing benefits is usually expected to convince senior managers to implement data governance or any new program. What is your recommendation regarding building this business case? I'll, I'll, I'll take this one, Kelly, I had the last one. Um, even if we don't get asked to do a business case, we do a business case. Um, it is really important. It's, I wouldn't raise, uh, some of you out there go, oh, business case, you know, this is so obvious. This is obviously got to have it because our customer data is horrible over it. You do the business case anyway. One main reason is how can you prove you're successful? Well, business case equals metrics, metrics equals success, all right? So you do a business case. Now, real quick. How do you do that? Well, remember those two diagrams I showed you that decompose the business strategy down to the various elements of EIM that we might want to deploy? Those business strategies already have benefits associated with them. If you can connect and convince that you're connected with that and you're a vital component, your business case will take care of itself. And then you can get start to get help from your business leadership as to how to build a business case. Remember, that strong sponsor is going to help you do that business case, too. You should not be left on your own to do the case by the sponsor. The sponsor leaves you on your own to do your case. You need a new sponsor. And that's another thing. So that's a quick answer uh, to that one, Shannon. <laughs> I love it. Um, next question coming in is, it's very hard to scope the work efforts at large companies like FedEx with some many um, opcos that need to be deployed as well. Any advice? I guess I'll take that one. Uh, I think just kind of piggybacking off of the, the previous question around the business case, the business case many times will help you to prioritize and be able to look at, okay, here's the enterprise requirements, but based on what we've committed to in the business case, here's our starting point. So that's a, another purpose of 
doing that effort to identify the highest priority business issues. Um, it, you know, it's, it's virtually impossible to just look at your data landscape and say, hmm, I think we're going to define our metadata starting with this data attribute and, uh, you know, go create data lineage up and down the track uh, and get resources to execute on something that is as hypothetical and never ending as an activity like that. So really using that business case to say, okay, what from a data perspective do we need to do? What activities are associated with that? And how do we then impact the organization as we have received agreement based on our business case? So that's a big prioritization process. And then of course that business case is revisited over time that helps you to then adjust and update your priorities uh, across your organization. I don't know, John, if you wanted to add. No, I'm good. Let's go to the next one. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, well, actually, and we certainly have time, John, if you want to add to that. There's um, a few of the questions. Well, well let me oh, go ahead. But there's, one that's kind of, there's two that have come in as kind of a follow-on to that, which I think will help. Um, uh, uh, um, on, on that, if you would not, if you wouldn't mind, um, there, there's a question just came in um, uh, uh, that the business side wants uh, the data administration team to shut up and go away, um, and uh, even though they're economically justified, um, economically justified does not equate to engagement of the business, right? So what your problem there is what we've been talking about the whole thing. Your sponsorship or your or your, your hook into the business, uh, and if you're I, if you're a DA area, then that means you're kind of IT led. Um, your hook into the business is not strong enough. Um, uh, it, it, it's, no one's giving you the air cover you need uh, because uh, someone you're, you you know your your strong sponsor needs to grab that. So. Um, Another thing you can do is, well, well, okay, you've got, you've done it, you've justified yourself. What happens if you don't get to finish? What happens if things don't get done? That would be your next step, is to show what the outcomes are if you're not allowed uh, to to complete. And that was kind of an extension of what Kelly was just uh, uh, talking about. So now I'll throw it back to you, uh, uh, Shannon, for the next one. Sure, and uh, you know, if uh, for your questions, make sure you're submitting in the bottom right hand corner in the. Um, Q and A section, so we can all see those questions coming in. And do we get to Chuck's question? I don't know. That this was one of the ones you started with, John. I might. I am between IT and research endeavor for our database. Um, fac uh, faculty generally agree on the need for DG. Thoughts on enlisting them in the actual development of the procedures? Could you ask that one again? Uh, I didn't quite follow that one. Sure. Um, the question is, I, right now, the question is between IT and the research endeavor for their database. Um, faculty generally agree on the need for data governance, thoughts on enlisting them in the actual development of the procedures. Okay. Um, so actually just uh, of, uh, getting um, your stakeholders to participate in the, the process. Well, there's incentives, and Kelly can chime in on on this one, you need to build, you need to make part of your team the people that will be benefiting from this. It, they, they should not just be observers. They need to be uh, built in. Um, uh, Kelly, do you want to expand on that? Or, or, or sure. I, I mean, I, I definitely, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that they, uh, if these procedures impact their area, they're going to have a vested interest in making sure that it is something that is workable for them, workable for their staff, and gives them the results that they're looking for. If they don't understand how some of these governance activities do impact their organization and their groups and the work that they do on a daily basis, then two things, in my view, would need to happen. One is that there might need to be better uh, communication about that link. So uh, uh, why is it important? How does it impact the data they use? How does it solve some of the business problems that they've been having? Or maybe that particular question or that particular procedure uh, should be best uh, focused on another individual within the group. But the idea is that as you build out these data processes, you should have the team of people identified who use that data 
in their jobs and in their daily life so that they can participate in uh, ensuring that the data is uh, optimized for them or that the data is at least understood across multiple different consumption groups or multiple different use uh, user groups, and that's your uh, operating model, your operating framework, and the staffing of that operating model and operating framework is proactively identifying those people, getting their accountability so that when it comes time to develop those procedures, they're already on board and expecting to participate. Love it. And just to kind of go a little deeper, you know, we'd all like to know how to harness a manager's avarice and ambition. Avarice is such a great word. And ambition to benefit the organization. The only way to do that would seem to be absolutely positively guarantee success for a data governance initiative. Any additional direction? Wow. Um, the word <laughs> of, the word avarice was <laughs> such a an interesting choice of words. I know. I love it. Uh, <laughs> There, uh, um, uh, whoever submitted that, I hope he's not listening. All right. But anyway, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, um, well, you know, it's an old organization change tactic, uh, and it's you know, if you want to read about it, read Machiavelli, right? Um, uh, uh, what's in it for them? Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you want them to have guaranteed success, uh, and there's two parts of this, and then I'm going to pass it back to Kelly because uh, she's Oh, so good at, at restating what I said much more eloquently. Um, <laughs> but but um, no. But first of all, practical stuff. If that's the kind of sponsor you have, assuming you're stuck with them, uh, give them some wins. Give them some wins. Uh, do something that might not uh, strategically be the best thing, but tactically looks good. Look, you know, play the game a little bit, right? Um, and help and make them look successful. This is obviously a sponsor that is not going to take risks. So that said, one of the one of the characteristics, if you go to any, you go to uh, William Bridges uh, or go to uh, any of the other uh, great authors on culture change or anything, uh, one of the key characteristics of a good sponsor is they're willing to take a risk. So the, the bottom line for this thing is it's not a very good sponsor of your effort. But if you're stuck with them, Give them some wins. Uh, Kelly, I'll pass that one on to you. See if there's anything else you can add to that. Sure. Yeah. So we've so great example. We worked with uh, a client where there was uh, an actually an IT leader who wanted to become the equivalent of a chief data officer within this organization, and governance was actually under the IT organization. And so the challenge was is it wasn't being very successful. There was not uh, good business involvement. There was tactical business involvement, um, but it wasn't really uh, driving value across the enterprise, creating consistency across the enterprise, or improving pro uh, productivity across the enterprise. Well, so this individual sponsor, um, one of the things we started to do was to help understand what that goal of becoming a chief data officer was about, how they saw governance playing into the opportunity to have a chief data office in the organization and uh, potentially prioritizing um, the work that is being done in governance to help uh, create a level of formality around data and data management in general, which would therefore benefit uh, this person's uh, justification for having a chief data office. Now, I'm not saying that the prioritization of those personal needs uh, became uh, in conflict with any other sorts of business needs, but really it's understanding personal goals, determining how the effort of governance can uh, support some of those personal goals, and at the same time, how to identify and still drive business impact by doing so. So what we had found is that in order to support this initiative of becoming a chief data officer, one of those things is looking at data as an enterprise asset, which was one of the challenges that this organization had. Governance helped to identify those data elements that were truly used across the enterprise and started to define and, and put some structure about them being an enterprise asset. That 
uh, ability to see data as an enterprise asset helped to justify a role of data across the enterprise, which helped to support this individual sponsor and stakeholder, which gave him more interest and activity and helped him become more vocal about the program. And in fact, he enlisted uh, more senior business sponsors to then help make the program successful. So that's just an example. I realize that we're out of time, but uh, you know we're happy to uh, take this offline and provide some more uh, thoughts and guidance uh, as well. So anyway, back to you, John and Shannon. Hey, Shannon, let's wrap it up. Sounds good. Thank you, Kelly and John, for this great presentation. And again, Kelly, welcome to the series. This is, uh, we're so glad Thank to you. have you with. And. Uh, um, so thanks, as always, to our attendees for taking the time to engage in everything that we do for your great Q&A questions. Again, just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, and um, as well as information on how you can get more information from John and Kelly. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.